Hey, it's good to have you here. Come on in, have a seat. Welcome to the Beyond Picket Fences podcast. We are your hosts, Mandy Benicky and Naomi Marquez. Hi, everybody. It's Naomi Marquez. I am going to introduce myself. So I'm going to tell a little joke. My maiden name is Naomi McNutt. And what would you call Rocky Mountain Oysters if they were made at McDonald's? McNutt. So I also, my name backwards is uh, Imone Tuncum. So if that tells you a little bit about my upbringing, um, that is an introduction into my world. I'm a grandma. I have four grandchildren, ages six to 12, three girls and one boy. I am a mommy. I have four children, uh, 25 to 32. One is a biological daughter. I have three stepchildren, one um, daughter and two sons. I'm also a wife of uh, Richard Marquez. We've been together for 24 years. I am a sister of three younger brothers, ages 40 to 46. I am a daughter. I'm also a friend. Um, Those of you who know me also know that I am a businesswoman. For 29 years, I have been in the same industry. I love working, I love money. I have uh, built two uh, management companies from scratch. So, woo, scratch. (laughs) Um, And um, I strongly believe in karma. Thoughts become things, and then you are what you consume. I hope you enjoy my story. Hi, Naomi. Hi, Mandy. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm pretty good. Good, good. Good. So today we are going to talk about da, 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 your story. Ah! Are you going to tell part of it, all of it? So I think I'm going to tell all of it. Um, I have been asked to try to start at the beginning and make it all the way through today. So I'm going to try to do that. Um, a lot of what I'm going to say, I've actually never told anybody, or if I have told somebody, it's only a couple people. So this is going to be um, probably pretty emotional for me, but I'm ready for it. Okay. Um, the Our uh, guests have really inspired me to tell my story. So here I go. Um, I was born in 1973 in California. And we moved to Colorado with my two younger brothers and my youngest brother was born here in Colorado. So I had uh, three younger brothers that I enjoyed being able to control when I was younger <laughs> and they obviously didn't enjoy it as much as I did. And the first memory that I have that I really has impacted decisions that I've made since this was we had we had lost um, my parents had lost their jobs they didn't have a lot of money we had to move to California my grandparents have a ranch um, and they raise Arabians and they allowed us to have a camper Mm -hmm. on their ranch and we lived in this camper it was six of us so my bedroom was the dining room table so your entire family lived in a camper yep we lived in a camper my um, parents the couch was their bed and uh, there was a bunk bed for my other two brothers and then my youngest brother was in a bed above the couch we all lived in just like you know one of those hitch campers on the property and at the time I didn't know any different we played we played um, with the horses Uh, I thought it was exciting to like pick up poop in the stalls and there was so much (laughs) land that I just had a big old playground Mm -hmm. and it's funny fast forward to a conversation I had with a girlfriend a few years back and I remember saying yeah I lived in a trailer and she goes can you describe the trailer to me she goes oh that was a camper I'm like oh this whole time I've been thinking I lived in a trailer trailer a camper luxury right right so I um so in this in this um, phase of my life, I was still trying to find friends. So I was a nerd, didn't have a lot of friends, and people didn't find me entertaining. So kids always had these groups that they clicked in, and I didn't click in a lot of those groups. But there's one little girl, she wanted to be my friend, and I was super excited. So um, she invited me over to her house, and they were laborers for the rancher 
So they um, helped with the orchards and with their pig farm. And I remember going to dinner at their house. So they had a trailer, an actual trailer, not a camper, mm-hmm. but they had a trailer that they had on the ranch. And I remember sitting at their table and there was a pig's head that was on the dining room table. And I was looking at the neck part Mm -hmm. of the inside of a pig's head while Mm -hmm. we were eating dinner. (laughs) And I, after dinner, we went to the back of the camper and her brother said, hey, let's play a game. And I was like, okay. And he lined me, her and her sister up and engaged in some, um, in molesting us. Oh my God. And for me at the time, you know, I didn't really understand what was going on. How old was this kid? So if I think back to it, he must have been three or four years older than me. And I was in second grade. And my friend was it was, she was very comfortable when I say comfortable in quotes she knew was what was expected of her mm. so she had been through this before mm. so for me I all I remember thinking to myself was this must be what it takes to have friends so this is like a middle schooler that's molesting you yeah oh my yeah God. and I remember thinking well if we're all here in the same room and they're okay with it, then I should be okay with it because this is normal. Mm -hmm. And this is the first time, you know, that I had experienced something like this. And I was, I was afraid, but the other two that were in the room to me didn't seem like they were afraid. Mm -hmm. Obviously they were, and they weren't comfortable with it. Mm -hmm. But as a young little girl, I was just trying to have friends. So I didn't realize that that wasn't okay. Mm -hmm. And the next day, um, it was the weekend, and um, I remember going back and being really happy that I had friends. It it wasn't it wasn't that situation that impacted me negatively. I focused on the fact that somebody liked me enough. They had friends that they included me in their their life. So on Monday, I remember going to school and. My new friend, I had left my panties over there mm-hmm. and like a pair of my shorts. And I remember she dumped it on my desk table in front of the whole school and well, the whole class and said, ha ha ha, Naomi, you were over and you left your dirty clothes and she dumped them on my table. Thinking back now, I think that she was trying to spare me from ever coming back and having to do that mm-hmm. and having to go through that again. Right. Mm -hmm. And for her, she was probably embarrassed and and didn't want, you know, that around um, uh, me. And I look at at the time, I remember being heartbroken because she didn't want to be my friend and everybody was making fun of me. And I was devastated, devastated that she did that. And it wasn't the molestation Mm -hmm. that really got to me. It was wanting Mm -hmm. to be her friend. That's interesting because um, obviously bullying is a big topic and that behavior is bullying, right? Doing Mm -hmm. something like that in front of people to humiliate you is bullying. But you know what she was going through, Mm -hmm. you know, and so it's just, you know, good insight maybe to what potentially kids who are bullying might be crying out. You know, you know, I absolutely agree. It's something that I've that I've tried to help my kids understand and my grandkids. Bullies mean something's happening to them at school. Mm-hmm. It's happening at home. Somebody else is bullying them that they feel like they have to take control of somebody else mm-hmm. and hurt them because that's the only way that they can have control in their own life. Right. And so as I kind of moved through, um, I was the classic nerd. Um didn't have a lot of friends, actually an introvert. Surprisingly, people that know me would never know <laughs> that um, I wasn't comfortable talking to people. People weren't interested in me. Young kids um, would openly make fun of me in class. So fast forward, we move back to Colorado and my parents end up getting jobs and they're having uh, one to two jobs at a time to help support the family. So um, they're working a lot and we are all four in grade school 
and I'm getting bullied at school. Um, I have um, a memory where I'm walking home from school and these two girls, I had to have been in fourth or fifth grade, girls pull me down by my backpack and they beat me up and they throw me like on the side of the street the um, street by a gutter and I remember laying there going I just want you to be my friend like I don't understand why you don't like me um I remember playing on a playground and I had my Barbie with me and I always looked older I was the kind of girl where everybody was super petite um really little and short and I was tall big boned um I started my period young I had Mm -hmm. boobs young so I was made fun of because I was just bigger than everybody else Mm -hmm. And I remember playing at the playground and these girls are like, why are you playing on a playground? You're so much older. You shouldn't be playing with Barbie dolls. And I was like, I'm in like fifth grade, fourth grade. Like I'm young. Like I should Mm -hmm. be able to play. And I remember sitting on top of the slide going, I just don't understand why people don't like me. And I had a mullet at the time. So I was like a Joe Dirt mullet. (laughs) My mom um, cut my hair and uh, mom, I love you. And I know you're going to listen to this. This this episode, if you can take that that bad boy (laughs) off. So, um, I know, Mom, I love you dearly. Um, She cut my hair into a mullet. So, you know, they had the pleasure of making fun of me with a mullet. Anyway, so I, um, you know, bullied growing up and um, realized that I just really wasn't somebody that people enjoyed to be around. So I go into junior high and I am in middle school. And I am so excited because these girls want to be my friend. And it was probably like three or four girls. And they were friends. For, we were probably friends for a couple weeks. And it's called the Commons where we'd have lunch. And I remember being having my tray of food. And I go to sit down at this round table. And I sit down with all my friends. I'm super excited. And they all look at me. And they stand up with their trays. And they leave me at the table. Mm. And I look around. And probably nobody was staring at me, but Mm -hmm. in my mind, everybody was looking at me, right? And as they got up and left, they said, we never wanted to be your friend. And they left. So I remember, (laughs) I won't say it. I love the C (laughs) word, but Mandy won't let me say it. Um, So I remember the going to the nurse's office. I don't remember why I was so comfortable with her, actually, now that I think about it. Why did I end up there? I don't know. I went to the nurse's office, and I told her what happened. And I said, I have no friends, and I'm embarrassed to eat by myself. She said, well, you can pretend to be sick here. And I said, I can't? She said, yeah. So she had a couple beds, and one of the beds was behind a door. She said, as long as there's no kids that are sick, you can Mm -hmm. sit here. For the rest of the year, I was sick every day at lunch and she let me hide there because I didn't want people to know I didn't have any friends. Mm. It was amazing. Like I remember it was so freeing because for me, I, I could be somebody in class, somebody people liked. And then when I left the classroom, I could hide and nobody knew that I didn't have friends. Mm -hmm. Right. So it was, it was, um, it was really, really great that she did that for me. So I end up, changing schools. My parents, um, brought us into a different city here in just outside of, um, Denver. And I go to a different junior high and I meet this amazing girl who is still, um, a close friend of mine. And she taught me how to stand up for myself. She taught me how to cuss. She taught me how to, um, not be afraid of what I had to say. She taught me how to, uh, enjoy who I am as a young woman and not have to live up to other people's expectations. What a now, confident middle schooler. Holy cow. She's amazing. <laughs> you should, you should like, she's phenomenal. And hopefully if she's listening, she knows who she is. She inspired me to not give a fuck. Now, <laughs> obviously I did. Right. But it was that outward, Sometimes it's fake it till you make it. Mm -hmm. You have to learn how to be confident. How do you learn that? You start by just practicing. So she taught me to practice. She taught me to, um, to be confident even Mm -hmm. when I wasn't. And that was huge. So met her. She taught me how to, you know, be more confident 
And she taught me how to do my hair and she taught me how to start my makeup. And back then I had like Aquanet, right? And a blow dryer. <laughs> so she taught me how to do my bangs. She taught me how to do the wings, oh, you know, yeah. where I had the wings yeah. and the long hair. And so, <laughs> you know, that was the first time that I had really embraced that I could possibly be pretty. Mm. I'll keep drinking, Mandy. You're fine. It's, it's good. Well, it encourages me. Ice, <laughs> so, um, so I, I remember this is when I was, you know, first trying to like embrace who I was and that I was attractive. And I, I had a friend, if I want to go back a couple years. So back in sixth grade, I had made a couple girlfriends that, um, I really, really, really liked. And one of them taught me how to masturbate, mm -hmm. which was um, freeing for me, honestly, because she was the one who taught me how to be okay with my own body mm -hmm. and what that looked like and what that meant. And I appreciate that to this day because I was afraid of sexuality. And now as I've gone through therapy and looked back, it started with the molestation, mm -hmm. right? And there was a time in that space, I had another girlfriend who her sister was our babysitter and she actually molested me and my brother and actually asked me and my brother to do things to each other so she could watch and um, then did stuff to us. And I actually just told my family about this mm -hmm. um, about two years ago, they didn't know. And so, you know, as I fast forward again to, you know, learning how to be pretty, it was that whole sexual piece of it. I was very interested in it, mm -hmm. but wasn't sure if like what that meant. Cause right. to me having that experience was Why different. Why would you want to go down that road? Right. It was different. <clears throat> and I never spoke to anybody about it. I didn't talk mm -hmm. to anybody about it. You know, it wasn't something that I even thought I had the approval to discuss it or have any um, uh, issues with it either. Right. So people don't openly discuss, Hey, you know, are you being touched when you're not supposed to? And even if you do, you don't want to say yes, cause you don't want to hurt the other person's feelings mm -hmm. that it did happen to you. Well, you know, it's a bad thing. Mm -hmm. If somebody's asking mm -hmm. you that it's a bad thing. And so, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hi there. We wanted to take a moment of your time to invite you to join our Facebook community by searching Beyond Picket Fences and clicking like on our page. Instagram at BP Fences, Twitter at BP Fences, or as always on our website at bpfences.com. Sign up on our website to receive occasional emails and updates. We also invite you to support Beyond Picket Fences and our mission by subscribing to our Patreon page at patreon.com slash beyondpicketfences slash join. Thanks for your support. Now back to the episode. So I, um, so I remember, you know, looking in the mirror, being pretty, what does that mean? And she helped me again with sexuality. So she helped me with what does that look like? And, um, my mom, who is very open, we talked about it in the mm -hmm. period podcast, she has always been very open about sexuality. So I've always known that it was there and that was something we did with our body. And it's something that, you know, people do for pleasure. Mm -hmm. uh, I just didn't think that it was available to me in that, in that way. Okay. So I, um, I am getting, you know, excited about being a girl and I start doing my hair and I start doing my makeup and I start getting friends. And I realize now that if you assimilate, people like you. Mm -hmm. So now I'm starting to realize, I'm like, okay, if I act this way, if I look this way, if I can mirror what you do, I can be likable. Mm. And I realize now this is when I began the process of who Naomi's going to be. And it is all programming, mm -hmm. right? And you think about how women are programmed at a young age to fit in. Mm -hmm. It's when you realize who has friends, who likes who. And now if I act like them, I look like them, then I will be a part of that group. So I am starting to get friends and people are starting to like me. I'm starting to realize um, what possibilities are out there for me. 
and it is now the night before my sophomore year. So in this school that I was going to, high school was a sophomore. So you started mm-hmm. your sophomore year. Junior high was six, uh, seventh, eighth, and ninth. Okay. So I had just finished my eighth and ninth grade year with this new found, you know, group of friends, and I was starting my sophomore year. And my mom comes into my room that night and tells me that she's leaving my dad. So I find out the night before high school, and I cry all night. I wake up the next morning. I am. Uh, swollen eyes. I go to my first day of high school and all I can think about is my family's breaking up Mm -hmm. and my parents never fought in front of us. There was never a sign that there was a problem in our family. Mm. We had the perfect family in my mind. My, I was best friends with my dad. My mom was super supportive. My brothers, although we fought all the time, like we had each other's back. I would, I would fight people for my brothers. Uh, They would fight people for me. We were protective of each other. So I never thought that that Mm -hmm. would ever go away. So first day in high school, um, my mom tells me that. So I go to school and I realize my life is changing. So I somehow decide that I'm going to find a boyfriend. And I'd never really had a boyfriend. Mm -hmm. So I start eyeing out for boys and my eye catches a few guys that I like, but I, I really didn't think any of them were super attractive. I walk onto a school bus um, a, a few weeks after I had, you know, tried to, you know, talk with boys, but they weren't kind of talking to me or I wasn't talking to them. I can't really remember how it was. And I walk on a bus and this um, this boy sends me, goes, Naomi? I'm all, yeah. He goes, wow, you're looking really pretty. You want to sit next to me? I'm all, <laughs> yeah, dude, thanks. So I sit next to him and fast forward a few months, we're dating and uh, he breaks up with me and I'm devastated. And mind you at this time, again, my parents are separated now. I'm trying to live a life with my mom living one place, my dad living another, mm-hmm. my boyfriend breaks up with me and um, not feeling like anybody's paying attention to me, not feeling like anybody really understands what I'm going through, I decide to drink um, Southern Comfort and slice my wrists. Had you drank before? Oh, yeah. Yeah, you were drinking yeah. before. Oh, yeah. So um, this group of friends that I had met, they were drinkers, they were mm-hmm. druggers, you know, so I had started dabbling in um, uh, marijuana. I had done... Um, uh, some hallucinogens. I, I had to call my dad to come get me because I was paranoid. I was mm-hmm. tripping. And mm-hmm. um, so I had, it, you know, I'd started drinking. I'd started doing, you know, dabbling in drugs. And um, so I drank Southern Comfort and slit my wrists and passed out. So my brother, who's just underneath me, he found me in my bed- bedroom laying on my bed. And at the time, I wanted help. So Mm -hmm. this was a cry for help. I did not want to try to kill myself. Mm -hmm. Uh, At the time, I didn't think that anybody would listen to me. And honestly, it was a cry for attention. So at that time, my parents then put me in a uh, 30-day facility to help me with my problems. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I look back now and... It was a massive wake-up call for me. Is this like a drug treatment facility? Yes. Okay. Yeah. And they focused on the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. They should have focused on my mental health Mm -hmm. and not the um, drug and alcohol abuse because that was a symptom of the mental. That's that's what you're using to mask your your pain. Yeah. 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 And I remember going in there and the drug addiction and the alcoholism that was there was awful and it was a really good experience for me to see that what I thought was bad really wasn't as bad as I thought it was Mm -hmm. in comparison to the lives that these young people had to endure from cigarettes being burnt out on their bodies Mm -hmm. being beaten um, the sexual abuse that they had uh there's a gal there who was raped by her father and she was having her father's child mm. uh, watching them go through detox mm-hmm. and the shakes 
and the pain and mm-hmm. the screaming. And so, um, mm-hmm. it was, it was good for me to understand the positive things in my life and to help me understand that drugs and alcohol don't fix anything. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I want to say that things could be worse. Mm-hmm. I think a lot of times we live our life and we, we, we only know what's in our little bubble. And when right. you realize what else is out there, you see that if you can have the proper tools to get through it, mm-hmm. that it's not as, I don't want to say as bad because I, everybody's perception of their own experience is real. Right. But it right. helped me put into perspective what I should be grateful for. Right. Well, it makes me think, you know, teen teenagers, it's pretty common for them to drink. Right. Mm-hmm. And you know, a lot of people's reaction is, you know, whatever, like grounding them or um, maybe putting them in rehab. Mm-hmm. Probably not because it's really difficult to get somebody into rehab right now. It just, mm-hmm. yeah. you know, the logistics of it, yeah. it's, it's difficult. But yeah. um, so they're not going to see a rock bottom of other people like you saw. But we still need to, tr- you know, we still need to understand that pain is pain. Yes. And so you have to understand that your kids, whatever their pain is, whether you are like, you know, other kids have it so much worse than you. Well, that doesn't matter because the outcome could be that your kid is feeling pain and doesn't wake up, you know? No, it's true. I think that's how, you know, you think about accidental suicide. mm -hmm. And, you know, I know I did not want to die. Mm -hmm. I was crying for help, but I could have. Yeah, absolutely. And when you look at young people and when you think about what they're going through and you wonder why it's, it is their, it is their interaction with their own world and what they think other people's lives are so much better than theirs. And when I say that, it's more about the openness and the communication for people understanding that you just want to be heard. Mm-hmm. A lot of it is you just want people to care enough mm-hmm. to make you number one right? at that time. And when pain, when you feel pain, whether it's mental or physical, what I think a lot of people often refer to or, or revert back to is, oh, they must have been in pain a long time. This must have been really wearing. But what they don't realize is sometimes that pain is so intense that We've talked about this before, and I don't know if it was another podcast, but whether it's physical or mental, you like part of your brain shuts down and you don't care. Like Mm -hmm. it's so it's kind of like an in the moment. And so it's not necessarily something that has to like drag on. You know, that's a good point. If I'm listening to what you're saying. So if you think if, if, if people listening to this podcast knew me as a child, Mm -hmm. they would never know what went and led up to me trying to kill myself. Right. Because I was happy. I was fun. Mm-hmm. I had a good time. Even in treatment. Nobody knew until what? A couple of years ago? Yeah. Like that. Nobody. Because to me, it was a buildup. Like, mm-hmm. right. It it was a short period of time that I just couldn't take it anymore. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't just my parents who got to, were getting divorced and it wasn't just my boyfriend breaking up with me. It was since I was a young child, everything that had happened that I had just kind of dismissed. Mm-hmm. Right. And until two years ago, which we'll get there in my story, I hadn't even dealt with the men- the mental piece of it. Mm-hmm. Right. So rehab dealt with, Oh, Naomi, don't drink, don't do drugs because it puts you in a bad place. Mm-hmm. It didn't talk about why was I drinking? Why was I doing drugs? Mm-hmm. It didn't it didn't really focus on that mental health because their position was we have to fix the alcoholism and the drug abuse. Mm-hmm. Well, if you don't fix the mental stuff, that's all that stuff's going to come back. Right. Right? Well, and I think the less like I was trying to take a lesson from, you know, these stories. Yeah. And the lesson for me is no matter how menial you think somebody's pain is, To recognize it. Yes. Because it may seem like nothing to you, but it may seem so big to them that, you know, something like that can happen. Well, and and you think about young people now. I got to escape bullying when I got home. Mm Mm-hmm. A lot of people, parents continue it. Absolutely. And now with social media. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. It's constant, right? Mm -hmm. So I think about how hard, you know, 
the bullying was, which when that would have continued for you for sure. Absolutely. It wouldn't have it stopped. It would have gotten worse. Absolutely. And because we didn't have cameras back then. Yes. Think about locker rooms, like things like yes. that, bathrooms. Yes. You know, and, um, you know, so going, so when I got out of rehab, I definitely had a different outlook on life because I realized, okay, I, I can, I can try to work through the issues that I have. Um, and I really, really did come out of that as my life is better than I thought it was. I'm going to focus on the good things. I'm going to focus on the things that I can control. So leaving rehab did give me that sense of empowerment Mm -hmm. that I could have control over certain parts of my life. And in rehab, you can't wear makeup. You can't, you can't, um, mask anything. So it was raw. You had to deal with people in a raw level, which for me was really important because that, you know, it helped build a little bit more confidence about who I am. Mm -hmm. So So at this point, you're about 16 years old. Yep. I'm 16 years old and um, I'm in high school. So I am a junior in high school and they call me in with my mom and say that I am uh, difficult in the school. They tell me that uh, I don't have the ability to learn like the other kids do. They can't tailor classes around me that... um, I should probably just quit school and go get a job. And my mom is sitting there like, you've got to be kidding me. You're telling her to drop out of school. And they just, they didn't have any kind of um, structure that would help me. Mm -hmm. I, I, you know, if anybody looks back, I probably, they would classify me as having ADD. Mm -hmm. Um, Right. I, um, I definitely process things. I'm a visual learner. Mm -hmm. Um, I process things very quickly. I don't like to read. You process things differently too. Yeah. And yeah. I, they just had a very difficult time mm-hmm. teaching me. And then, so I transfer out and I go to another school and I uh, end up finding a whole group of friends there. I, I attach myself to somebody who's still a best friend of mine and she was friends with everybody at school. So she told, showed me how you can be friends with all different types of people mm-hmm. and how you don't have to be clicky. So you went to like a different public school. Yes. A different, different public school, school. Okay. for my senior year. Okay. So <clears throat> left that high school, went to a new high school for my senior year. And I met this, um, great group of friends who I still have many of them now and we're uh, very close. And I found that I had a personality and that people liked me and that I could uh, be myself. And I found a voice that people still, you know, I can say things and do things that probably shock people. And I found that voice at that time, right? Um, I found that voice at that time. And I actually found uh, my first true love. And Um, so I end up in high school in love with this boy and we have a very, um, passionate relationship Mm -hmm. and passionate, loving, fighting, loving some more, fighting some more. And my mom wants to separate us. So after I graduate, she, um, kicks me out. Mm -hmm. Actually, she lost me for a couple weeks, actually left and, partied and have a great time and left her house. And, um, and she finds me and sends me to the ranch where we were back when I was younger. This uh, is California. Yep. Okay. Back to California, back to the ranch and sends to the me camper there, to the camper. Right. <laughs> At this time, actually I was, this was a trailer. So my aunt, who's only two years older than me, she had a trailer on the ranch. So I actually lived with her in a trailer on the ranch and I went to nursing school to be a CNA. I didn't know that. Yeah. I went to nursing school to be a CNA and I shoveled shit and trained Arabians and did that for a year. And um, You so- should have been a ranger. That'd be way cooler <laughs> than a CNA. I mean, nothing against CNAs. But <laughs> well, let me tell you a story about being a CNA. So I am a CNA at Simi Valley Adult School. And we had to go work at a um, uh, uh, facility, and I had two patients. 
And one of the patients had just had dialysis. So they were like puking and um, Mm -hmm. they were sick and it was horrible. And another patient of mine, and they always told me, wear your hair up in a bun. Don't wear your hair down. I'm like, "Ah, I don't care. I don't care. My hair was down to my butt. And I was like, "Ah, I'm fine. And um, so I was all stressed out because one of my one of my um, clients, they were puking and I was trying to take care of her and her bedmate Mm -hmm. okay, was Naomi, 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 I need you. So I go over to help you and help her and she grabs my hair and pulls me down to the bed and goes, fuck my pussy. Oh my God. And I was like, what? And she was like, fuck my pussy. And I'm like, and I couldn't get my hair and she like has my hair and I'm down to the bed and one of my um, classmates had to come in and like pry her fingers off my hair and I came out of the room. This is like during your internship? Yeah. So okay. yeah, it was like a nine month course. And then like uh-huh. in the last couple months you had to go, you know, help out at a, a facility. Intense, and, um, so I remember my teacher brought me back and was like, are you going to quit on me? And I was like, no, she's like, I know this was really tough on you, but this is what happens. You know, right. like they were, you know, right. these are, you know, uh, older, you know, um, people and they they have problems and I was like no no no, I'm not gonna leave and I remember going home like oh you've got to be kidding like I can't do this I want to quit so bad and I remember writing my mom a letter begging her to let me come home and I would change my evil ways if she would just let me come home and I don't want to be here anymore and she after I graduated she let me come home I was so happy so I come home and I get back together with the love of my life so we're sneaking around Mm-hmm. And uh, my mom had moved into my um, I call my stepdick's house, and so we're living at my stepdick's house. And I decide to bring my love of my life in, and we start having sex in the closet down in the basement. Mm-hmm. And he's wearing a condom or whatever we're doing mm-hmm. our thing. And a month later, I'm pregnant. So mm-hmm. I am now 19 years old, pregnant, and I was s- excited. I was so happy. I'm like, I am going to get food stamps and I'm going to get on medic. I'm going to get, you know, government assistance. I signed up for getting on section eight to get housing. And I did all this stuff. And my girlfriend at the time was pregnant too. So we were going to be neighbors at, um, uh, uh, housing, uh, place. And we were going to live together and raise our kids and do amazing things. And that all changed when, her man and my man decided not to be a part of our lives anymore. And we decided to have an abortion. Both of you. Yeah. Mm. So I remember going in and my dad took me to go get my abortion. Your real dad. My biological. Yes. And I remember driving up to the abortion clinic and there were protesters and they had all of those awful signs. Mm-hmm. And we drove up and my dad, I remember thinking, feeling bad for him that he had to see all that, knowing mm-hmm. that I was going to honestly kill his grandbaby, mm-hmm. right? And I remember in my mind, I wasn't worried about myself. I was worried about him. And we pull up in the parking lot and he takes me into the facility and you, there's a waiting room. And they brought me back and it's just like, you know, a gynecologist, Mm -hmm. you're going in for a pap smear. It's the Mm -hmm. same exact thing. And they had a comfort nurse there that held my hand the whole time. Mm -hmm. And I bawled, Mm -hmm. cried, uh, sobbing the whole time. And it's something that is forbidden to talk about. Mm Mm-hmm. Because it's such a taboo thing. And if women were more open about the pain and the suffering that happens to make the decision, Mm -hmm. the family that has to be involved with the decision, the Mm -hmm. process, women would get the support they need for that. Mm -hmm. And um, it was a... Well, and I think more people would realize that it's not not something that people just do willy-nilly for, you know, birth control. That's a pretty painful thing to go through. It really is. Both mentally and physically. It really is. And I remember, I remember making the decision to have it done. And I remember telling my mom 
that I was going to do it. And that's painful, right? Having to tell the family that you've decided not to keep the baby Mm -hmm. and feeling and it boiled down to, I couldn't do it on my own. Mm -hmm. Right. Once, once the, once daddy decided he couldn't support me, I knew I couldn't do it on my own, Mm -hmm. you know? So, uh, after that, I, um, you know, just like the being molested and, you know, being bullied and, you know, um, all of that, I just kind of put it back somewhere, Mm -hmm. you know, and just moved on. And, and, you know, again, I'm very, I'm a fun person. I have a good time. You know, um, most people do not know. I will probably tell you that most people do not know I've been molested. Most people do not know I've tried to kill myself. Mm -hmm. And I don't think anybody knows until now that I had an abortion, Mm -hmm. except for the family that was around me. And I just, you know, bulldoze through life, right? Mm -hmm. You just keep going, fake it till you make it. Right. I learned that when I was young. Mm -hmm. And um, so fast forward a couple years, I am now uh, 20 and I'm marrying the father of that baby that I did not have. Oh, so you you got together again. Yeah, we got back together again and we got married, got pregnant Mm -hmm. and had a little baby. Mm hmm. And I remember one, the first time I knew I was going to leave him was when we got in a fight and I used that beautiful little baby as a shield Mm. between me and him because I knew he'd never hit her. Mm. And uh, I was laying on the floor and we were fighting and she was next to me and I grabbed her and I put her between the two of us. Now... I don't want to kid you. I had protected myself and I was not all the best wife either. I had thrown pans of grease and meat at him. I broke a phone, you know, back in the day when we had like phones with a handle <laughs> over, his held, <laughs> over his head. Um, so we just had a very passionate relationship. Mm-hmm. And I remember that moment that I did not want her to grow up and be me. Mm. And I did not want her to have to endure the relationship roller coaster Mm -hmm. that we had. So at that time I decided that I was going to take the time and I was going to take the next six months and figure out a way to leave that abusive relationship. Mm -hmm. And I did. And I left him. And from there I uh, got divorced, Mm -hmm. found my new husband who had three kids of his own. Mm -hmm. And we ended up, um, and so now I'm 23 and I'm still breastfeeding. Uh, so eight months, and she's eight months old. I'm still mm-hmm. breastfeeding. Um, leave him and go into another relationship. A year later, we end up moving in together with the four kids. So now we have four kids together. Mm-hmm. I'm 24, having a great life. And we end up buying a house together. So now we have a house. We have our four kids. I'm living next to my mom, which he obviously a son-in-law living right next to your mom. Like that was not, that's the best scenario ever, right? <laughs> that's what I, I loved it. I loved it. We have a story one time. So two stories. So the first story is we would have food missing from our refrigerator. And we always thought that it was our kids come to find out after investigation, it was my youngest brother. Cause my mom didn't have milk and her cheese in her refrigerator. <laughs> he would come into our house at night and take our food out of our refrigerator. <laughs> you had a dairy thief. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> so we, uh, that was one story. And then mom, when my mom would rearrange her house, she would have extra, you know, accessories or whatever. And we'd come home and pictures would be on our wall or things would be she rearranged in our house. Her house. She would just start decorating our house because she had extra <laughs> I wish somebody stuff. somebody would do that for me. <laughs> <laughs> so it was great. I loved living next to mom. It was fantastic. And um, so I'm 29 And um, I am throwing a surprise birthday party for my best friend at my house. And we it was a great party. We had a stripper and we had, there was a good 30 or 40 of us at my house. And we're having a fantastic time, girls, boys. So we have her birthday party. And then a few months, as I'm fast forwarding in in the months after, my relationship with my husband is getting just kind of weird. Like we're not as happy Mm. as we usually are. Things are um, wrong. I'm not sure what's going on. 
And I couldn't pinpoint it, but you just know that there's something not right. right. So it's November of um, that year. I'm turning 30 in January. Mm-hmm. Okay, so it's two months before my 30th birthday. We're sitting at Caldonia's. Um, and we're just getting tossed. And my girlfriend looks at me and says, I fucked your husband. <gasps> and I looked at her and I said, excuse me? She goes, I fucked your husband. And I look behind me and my husband's standing right behind me. And I said, did you fuck? And her this name. person. <laughs> and he goes, we got to go. I was like, you better tell me right now. He goes, we're leaving. So we get in the car. And I was like, did you fuck her? Blah, blah, blah. He was like, yeah. So a husband cheats on me. And for the next couple months, it was really tough. It was really tough. And, you know, you look at women who have been cheated on and you look at women who have stayed. Mm-hmm. And you wonder why. Mm-hmm. And I was one of those women who never thought my husband would cheat. Ever. Mm-hmm. Ever. And also didn't think I'd be a woman who stayed if my man cheated on me. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you, they do cheat and I do stay. (laughs) So, and don't know until you're there. You don't know. Well, and and your life, your circumstances change throughout life. Mm -hmm. You know, I used to say like, I used to look at those people and say, I would never stick around. You know, I would be out so fast, blah, blah, blah. Well, things change when you have kids, Mm -hmm. when you realize that, relationships are complicated Mm -hmm. and it takes two. It really does. Mm -hmm. So it does. It does. And you know, I, there was a lot of time invested in the relationship, Mm -hmm. four kids. And I truly, truly loved the man that he was. I love him. Mm -hmm. And I had to learn it to forgive. And that was hard. Mm-hmm. So I had a couple best friends at the time. So the best friend that didn't cheat on him with him uh, was like, look, you either leave him or you got to forgive him because mm-hmm. you don't get to keep torturing him. Because at this time in my life, I was a few months in, I was still torturing him, you know, and she was like, you got to figure this out. So I decided um, I decided to forgive him and not forget. So I sat him down and I said, look, if we're going to do this, there's a couple rules. One is. I get to talk about this whenever I want. Mm -hmm. I can tell anybody I want about you cheating. Anybody. Mm -hmm. And you cannot tell me or make me feel guilty for outing you. I have to know that I have control. And you cannot tell me what I can and cannot do when it comes to who I am as a woman. I'm not going to tailor myself. Because at this part of my life, I still, you know, I... I was still very adamant about being a good wife Mm -hmm. and being the right wife. And that comes with submission, Mm -hmm. right? Even subconsciously. And, you know, at this time I was, um, you know, strong in my career. I was making six figures by the time I was 29. I was well off in what I was doing. I was, so people would be surprised to know how, I took a back seat in the relationship mm-hmm. because people who know me, you knew me in my twenties. Right. People wouldn't think that you're I. You're a powerhouse. Yeah. That's what, that's what you're known as. And, but in my relationship, I really did take a back seat to make sure that I didn't overpower, overstep, mm-hmm. right? The man, the husband. And when I decided to stay, I said, I'm not going to do that anymore. And I want to be who I want to be. And he said, anything. Was it, sorry, I don't no, mean please. to interrupt, her, but was it, you didn't want to overpower the man or the husband or you just wanted a part in your life where you were not, where you could just sub- submit and not be in control all the time. I think it could be both. Yeah. I think it could be both. I'm like that when we go it's vacationing. it's stressful to be, you know, in control all the time. All the so time. to have a place in your life where somebody else makes all the decisions for you is great. You know? I, I think about that. That's how I am on vacations. I don't want to make decisions on vacation on vacation too i'm like i need somebody else doing all (laughs) of it no planning (laughs) none none (laughs) like i don't want to plan at all so i um so i decide to stay with him and for um 
all of the people who um, I have the pleasure of being friends with, they all know that Rich cheated on me. If there's one thing in my life that everybody knows about is that. <laughs> They may not know I was molested. They don't know I tried to kill myself. Mm -hmm. They don't know that I was, a, you know, that I was in a um, very passionate relationship um, that didn't always have um, the right love um, given back to me mm -hmm. and me to him. But they all know he cheated on me. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. I've been in the room when, you know, you've said it in front of him, in front of my husband, too. And he, it, you know, yeah, I did. And it's kind of... Um, refreshing you know people admit to their vulnerabilities and their faults and you know their mis mistakes maybe it wasn't a mistake mm -hmm. maybe he grew and you grew and your relationship grew because mm -hmm. of that you know mm -hmm. um but yeah there was no defensiveness it was like yeah i did okay next topic yeah <laughs> and everyone's on the table's like what <laughs> just happened next please next topic no <laughs> oh it's funny we were uh, we were in our backyard uh the other night and we were talking about me telling the story he's like is there any way you could leave me cheating out of the story? Mm -hmm. And he was like, I'm just joking. He goes, no, really. He said, you know, as much as it's embarrassing for me to know that people know, if more, this is what he said, if more women would out their husbands and boyfriends for cheating, they wouldn't cheat anymore. Mm -hmm. He said, there's no way I would ever, ever do that again, knowing that all you're going to do is tell, is tell everybody he goes so <laughs> well, vice versa like the women cheat too like I've, right. I've never cheated on my husband but i've cheated on ex-boyfriends um and it it's like a secret that you carry like through life like most people don't know that i ever cheated on you know six boyfriends ago <laughs> um and nor would they care but for some reason that's like some weird secret like yeah. just keep it in Right. It's, all, it's all part of learning. It's all part of life. You're absolutely you know? correct. You are absolutely correct. And that is that is a piece for both of us that has really helped us grow together, right? Is being able to embrace the fact that it happened and own it and not be ashamed of it and not feel like I'm less of a woman because I decided to stay. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't give him more power because I stayed. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't. Because that's where it happens, right? Is that shame that you stayed mm -hmm. and the fact that nobody yeah, knows. Yeah, to have that dirty secret mm -hmm. just never leads to anything mm -hmm. good. And when you hold that as a couple, it's just, well, and that leads to, you know, sickness and everything else yeah. in your future, you know? Yeah. But. So now I'm 30 years old and I am going into what I thought was going to be the worst 10 years of my life. Oh my I was God. so afraid to turn 30 because I didn't want to so grow amazing. up. It was amazing. So amazing. 30s were fantastic. The best years of my life. I was, oh my gosh, so fun. So Mandy and I, we had a lot of fun times <laughs> together. <laughs> yeah, we did. We had a lot of fun times together and we had a great time with our kids. Our kids were mm -hmm. with us everywhere. We uh, vacationed. We had just so much we were making great money we had a great house we had every all the kids were in the perfect ages that we didn't have to take you know watch everything that they did and they were super independent we had fantastic friends so you know this was that 10 year period of my life where things were you know there wasn't a lot of trauma mm -hmm. so you think about from the first time i was molested no trauma, to I'm no 30 drama. right it was a really good set like of 10 years a lot of hungover there was a lot of hangover <laughs> there was a lot <laughs> and um this was when i became to do i started healthy eating mm -hmm. i started changing the way that the things that i put into my body except for the alcohol uh and i really focused on me and this was that 10 years that i was like who am i who do i want to be what am i all about so my last probably three years of my 30s, I started having periods, uh, really like when I started having periods, I started having long periods. So they were, you know, 14 days, then they ended up being around 21 days. And I started going to doctors and I started asking questions and nobody had answers. Mm -hmm. One doctor said, go get a hysterectomy. And I was 37 years old. My mom was like, you're not doing that. Mm -hmm. So I just started doubling up on my tampons. Mm -hmm. I started, you know, wearing pads and two tampons at a time. And I just dealt with it. 
and continued to, you know, eat healthy. I was still working out. We did CrossFit together, Mandy. Mm-hmm. You know, I started doing Pilates. I started, you know, really making sure that I was being as healthy as I could. And the summer of 2016, so I'm 43, mm-hmm. we get a call that my aunt, who's two years older than me, has breast cancer. And it was a quickly evolving breast cancer. And she, um, at the time, didn't have health insurance and was really trying to um, take care of things on her own. She's, I'm sorry, she's how old? Two years You're older 43, than me. You're 43, and so, so she's, she's 45. 45. Mm-hmm. Okay. So she gets breast cancer. And December of, so that's the summer, December of that year, my grandma sends this letter about health in our family, which our family never talks about health or anything mm-hmm. wrong. And she sends this letter about our family tree and, you know, cancer in our family and all mm-hmm. this stuff. And I was like, you know, I think I'm going to go get some blood work done and I'm just going to kind of check things out. So mm-hmm. it's January of 2017 mm-hmm. and it's the day after my birthday. So it's January 4th and I have my annual and Rich has his. So Rich is my husband and we always do it the same day right after each other. We go get it done and mm-hmm. we're out. So get our blood work done. And, um, or at the, I'm um, at the, um, doctor and I'm always on my period. So I don't ever get real pap smears. I haven't for mm-hmm. years. Cause every time I go, I can't, you have your period. Yep. Yeah. So she is, um, t- trying to do, she can't do a pap smear. So she does a, like a pelvic, um, exterior exam on my stomach. Mm-hmm. And she's like rolling around on my stomach. She's like, you know, your uterus is all the way over on the left hand side. Um, it's really odd. It's not where it's supposed to be. I'm going to send you to go have, um, an ultrasound done. Mm -hmm. I said, okay. So about a week later, I go get an ultrasound and no lie. This thing is probably from my elbow to the tip of my fingers. And it is a dildo Mm -hmm. wand, right? Mm -hmm. And they stick this thing up me for 45 minutes. Oh my gosh. And they're like moving this thing all around. They use that thing when you're first pregnant. Well, you probably didn't have that because you had Desiree so long ago, but yeah. When you're first pregnant, that's what they do. That's the ultrasound for for the well, baby. At least it was for me. So yeah. okay. and I was like, oh god, I'm, <laughs> you know, you're gonna stick that up, and I'm pregnant. Like, is you know, yeah. well, anyway, sorry. No, but I know what you're talking about. Yeah, it is it, huge. Yes, and I, you're right, because <laughs> I had an, ex- I had the topical, like the stomach uh-huh. X-ray is yeah. what they did for me when I had Desiree. So they stick this wand in there for 45 minutes, and as she's going, I can see that she's you know, making some notes on things. And I said, can I ask at the end? I was like, can I ask, is there something wrong? She goes, well, I'm not allowed to tell you, but I want you to know that I um, found seven fibroids, which at that time I didn't know what fibroids were. Mm -hmm. She goes, I found seven fibroids and one of them is the size of your palm. And um, uh, no, it was less than my palm. Sorry. It was like half of my palm. Mm -hmm. Um, And, but your doctor is going to have to tell you. Mm -hmm. I said, okay. So I go back to my doctor a week after that, so the middle of January and uh, third week in January, and I get some blood work done. And from there, I am I fly to California. I go to my cousin's uh, <clears throat> bridal shower, and in my mind, I'm trying to figure out what fibroids are. Mm-hmm. Nobody had told me what they were. I'm doing my own research, trying to figure out what they are. My doctor hadn't told me anything yet about my results of my ultrasound. I had this blood work done. And I am trying to kind of talk to my family during the bridal shower, like, because my aunt has cancer and what are they common? And everyone's kind of tied up with the bridal shower stuff. So, mm-hmm. you know, it's hard to kind of talk about health stuff when everyone's right. real super excited you don't about be the that. Downer when yes. You're, yeah. Yes. So I leave that and I come back to Colorado and my blood work comes back and everything's fine. I am perfectly fine. Everything's good. And at that appointment, they do tell me that I need to go see a gynecologist at, um, cause I was seeing a DO. So he's mm-hmm. like, you need to have a gun, find, um, go see a gynecologist because you do have fibroids and they're going to have to help you. So mm-hmm. I go see my gynecologist, brand new gynecologist. I had never seen her before. And she says, Hey, you know, by the way, I think I'm going to send you to go get a mammogram. I hadn't had a mammogram yet. So I'm 44. Mm-hmm. I was like, okay, I'll go get one done. So I go to get a mammogram 
And at this point, she had also said that most likely I'd have to have a hysterectomy to get rid of the fibroids Mm -hmm. and that they weren't going to be able to do the hysterectomy to take them out through the little incisions. Mm -hmm. Lapros. Yep. Whatever, yep. Yeah. Yep. That I was going to have to have um, surgery and it, they were gonna, like, like, you know, C section. Right. And I had a C section with um, my baby. So they would just use the same scar mm-hmm. and pull the uterus out and stuff. So um, I go to get my first mammogram. And I, by the way, horrible. Okay, I have <laughs> small little boobies. And I, I don't understand how women with breasts. This is shit they never tell you this is the shit they don't tell you okay let me tell you like the way that they make you move and you're like on your tippy toes and they grab your boob and they stretch it out and they flatten it on there and you're like literally it reminds me of like when you when you pump like they never tell you that either (laughs) can i just tell you how long my nipples are from breastfeeding and pumping they literally were the size of my pinky that's how long they are explain that it's horrifying anyway so yes mammograms are not comfortable (laughs) they're weird but necessary oh that's funny uh it's so funny so i get the mammogram and i leave you know go and get a call from a doctor the next day and they said uh we need you to come back and um we need to do another test and actually it wasn't the next day i think it was a couple days later because i was traveling and i was in atlanta Mm. and i remember getting the call um in atlanta at the airport and i had just landed and i answered the phone and she told me over the phone that i had to come back and have another mammogram Mm -hmm. and i remember standing in the hallway across from the food like the food court area and i put my head on the wall and i just started Mm. bawling and at that time i had it must have been tuesday or wednesday because i had to be i was traveling so i wasn't Mm -hmm. planning on being back home until friday night Mm -hmm. and the 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 guy that i work with he's fantastic he bought a thousand dollar ticket for me to get back home the next day Mm-hmm. to be able to get back for testing. Because I was like, oh, no, I'll be there. You know, I'll be there Monday. They're like, no, we need you here tomorrow. Mm. So I knew when they told me that I had to get yeah. right back yeah, that good. they needed to see me. So I go back and I get another mammogram. And I had gone with my girlfriend at the time. And I remember they gave me the results immediately. And they sat me down with my girlfriend and he said that I had um, I had to come in for a biopsy on Monday in this, and that um, I had cancer, and they had to find out what type of cancer. Mm. And it was horrible. And I actually forgot a piece of the story. It's so funny you forget the little things. Mm-hmm. So rewind a few days. They told me I had cancer over the, over the phone. Oh, so it wasn't when I've got my story messed up. Actually, I'm now that I'm thinking about, it, I have my story messed up. So I had the mammogram. Mm-hmm. Then they called me back for a second mammogram. There, they didn't tell me I had cancer. What they told me was that I had to have a biopsy to find out if it was cancer. Got it. I apologize. Mm-hmm. So they saw a lump, but it's yes, not necessarily malignant, malignant or yes. you know, it could be benign. Yes, yes. So. Sorry, you guys. It's getting kind of cloudy. Okay. So then Monday, I take my best friend and my husband, and we go and I get the biopsy. And that's our anniversary. Mm. So it's our wedding anniversary. We go, we do it. And the next day, my husband had to travel for work. So I took the day off work and waited all day. And I got the call at three o'clock that day. And they told me over the phone that I had cancer, Mm. which is interesting, right? That they tell you over the phone. It is weird. And so many times people say, you know how they call you in for the mm-hmm. results, but they won't tell you over the phone and the results are nothing. You're like, why mm-hmm. didn't you just tell me that over the phone? Right, exactly. But you're going to tell me I had cancer over the phone? Yeah. So I actually had to leave the next day for work. So I traveled and it went pretty quick from there. So that was February 21st mm-hmm. when I found out I had cancer. My first surgery was March 9th. And that was for my, I had a radical hysterectomy. Mm -hmm. Uh, By that time, my fibroids had gone from seven to 14 Mm -hmm. and they were growing 
and growing and growing. And they... So your cancer was hormone related. Yes, it was hormone related. So they took out my uterus and um, ovaries. They took everything. Mm -hmm. And what they did, because I was so anemic, because I'd been bleeding for, you know, seven years, they actually had to... So I didn't find out I was having my hysterectomy until two days before the surgery. So they called me on Tuesday and said that I had to have the hysterectomy because I wasn't ready. Uh, my body couldn't take the cancer surgeries mm -hmm. that I was going to have to do. Because you could bleed out. Right. right. So they brought me in and I had a, a radical hysterectomy. And from there, then that would put me in place to be able to have my surgeries for my breast cancer. So my breast cancer had not um, left its original space. So what that means is, is I had the um, benefit of not needing to have chemo or radiation if I decided to get a double mastectomy. Because mm -hmm. it, it wasn't growing or spreading. It hadn't spread. Time, it it yeah. still contained. Yeah. I could get a lumpectomy, but then I'd have to have radiation. I would have to have, um, you know, all of the um, uh, the pills and so stuff. So when they do a lumpectomy, um, they, what they do, they take out the lump, right? And then they do radiation on that spot. Is that what mm -hmm. they do? Okay. Yep. Yep. So at the time, at the time when... They found out that I had cancer. My aunt was already in stage four breast cancer, and she's only two years older than me. And we didn't know that. Did she go through the same type of treatment you did, or she was on she hers hers had left its original space, so she was doing oh, she, she, she was doing chemo. Mm -hmm. okay. And she actually, I had I was able to have my surgery before she did, so she was still on chemo. Mm -hmm. And I remember when I was going to go holistic with cancer. So they did chemo before surgery for her. Yep, yep. That's interesting. Did she choose that? Or is that because of the type of cancer? Or? So how aggressive her cancer was. They wouldn't oh, okay. even do the surgeries if until she was at a space totally where... Totally stopped it from growing. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. So I remember when I was going to... So all of this is so interesting. And I think a lot of people... Like I didn't... I have you... And I have mm -hmm. a, a couple more really good friends who have gone through breast cancer and everybody's story is different. They've all had different treatments, but it's really interesting because this is also the shit they never tell you, yes. you know, um, surgery is for breast cancer is insane. It's super invasive. Like, and I, d I didn't know that until I talked to all of you guys. Yeah. Yeah. So my, my aunt, she, I remember it's going to be, I was going to go holistic and I was like, look, I'm not going to get a lumpectomy. I'm not going to do. I'm not going to get surgeries. I'm going to cure this on my own. Mm -hmm. Right. And she called me and said, no, you're not. She's like, you're not because it's way too aggressive and you're not going to end up like me. She's like, you are going to do everything you can to get that out of your body. And I said, okay. And everybody's journey is different. Mm -hmm. And I remember talking to my surgeon and my surgeon requested her, um, information about her cancer and I had already had the um the genetics testing done and I was the first one to get my results back and I was negative she got hers back actually later than me and she was positive and so was my grandma so they were both positive and we're positive for uh not for BRCA but we're positive for another breast cancer mm. gene and but I was negative hmm. but our types of cancer were the same that's interesting. So because hers was so aggressive, my surgeon agreed with the decision to be so aggressive with on yours. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so we decided to do a double mastectomy. And because I didn't. Did you have cancer on both sides or just, just one? Like one? Okay. Mm -hmm. So we decided to do a double mastectomy because of how aggressive my um, aunt's cancer was and because of the cancer history in our family mm -hmm. that my, you know, grandma had given me back in December, that that was the best course for us because of how aggressive the cancer is in our family and how quickly it spreads. So we decided to do a double mastectomy because I didn't drink and I didn't smoke. I was eligible for immediate reconstruction, mm. which has only been around for a few years. Mm -hmm. So you, um, so when people talk about expanders, expanders are when you have a you have a mastectomy or a double mastectomy, and they go in over time to expand the space that your implant would be in between the muscle mm -hmm. and your cage. 
what they did for me because I was in a place where um, health wise, as long as I could get my anemia to get um, in place, I was eligible to have them both at the same time. So it was Mm -hmm. like an eight hour surgery. And they, they do the double mastectomy and then they immediately go in and stretch that space and put the implant in right away. Mm -hmm. And you don't have to go and have those expanders put in, which help increase the space for Mm -hmm. your implant. So you have one surgery instead of two and then you don't have to deal with the expanders, which I hear are quite painful as well. Extremely painful. Mm -hmm. So March 9th was my hysterectomy. And then April 26th is when I had my uh, double mastectomy and reconstruction. And it happened to be my one of my brother's birthdays. And I remember waking up and my biggest fear was losing my nipples. So for me, I sexually, nipples are a big deal to me. <laughs> like big, big deal to me. And I was terrified to lose my nipples to the point where I had a 10-page agenda the night before my uh, cancer surgeries. And I had... Um, everything laid out. If I came up and I couldn't have my reconstruction, if I lost my nipples, what did every, I went online, I found what mm-hmm. nipples I wanted, what tattoo artist I wanted. Mm-hmm. I knew the fake boobs that I was going to have. Um, they had these like, um, crocheted boobs that you could have in case they couldn't do the reconstruction. I had them oh, all picked okay. out. <laughs> so like I had all this stuff. We met at Red Robin, which is my favorite place like to eat. Birth plan, but <laughs> Ew. No, I was, but, <laughs> but boob plan and ask anybody. So I, I had anybody who was at the table that night. I had, it was very specific and laid out. If I woke up and everything didn't go perfect, what the next steps were to make sure like that I didn't lose my shit. So I wake up and my head is like my looking at my feet up in the air and my head is closer to the ground. And I wake up and I have, cause at this point, my boobs are like up in my throat <laughs> right? Because they're so high and they're up mm-hmm. here. And I look over and I'm asking what happened. And they had the room at like 130 degrees. It was really hot. And I was asking what's happening. Well, they were trying to save my nipples because they were, um, the blood wasn't getting to them. So they had my head down and so that the blood would race towards my breasts mm. and they had the room hot to kind of keep everything um, stimulated so that hopefully they wouldn't lose them. And I got to keep my nipples. I'm nice. still here. So it's very exciting. Um, and uh, so from there, I graduated from my surgery. And um, I I will tell you, the that lesson for me was the requirement to have mental therapy. Because part of my requirement that I had to... Um, that for my eligibility from my surgeon that I had was that I had to go to mental therapy Mm -hmm. and it was great because it forced me to talk about issues that I've talked about in the story that I haven't talked about before. And it has been an awakening for me. Mm -hmm. You know, we talk about why we do the podcast and what's that awakening. Mm -hmm. It was, I truly believe I got cancer because of Mm -hmm. all the trauma I've had in my life. And I just bulldozed through it. Mm -hmm. Didn't talk about it. Except for, you know, my husband cheating on me, which, you know, I talk about all the time. But besides that, I didn't talk about anything else. So I just stored it and stored it and stored it. And um, that's when I got into Reiki, got into meditation. I have um, gotten into routinely being able to take care of myself in the morning, making sure I don't go straight into social media, that Mm -hmm. I focus on me, I focus on my mental stability, I focus on my physical health, I care about what goes into my body, I care about my mind and what I'm thinking about and what I'm manifesting, all of that. Mm -hmm. And that has been the most amazing journey for me is really recognizing my true and inner demons and working through them Mm -hmm. and how I have hurt people along the way because of those demons and how I unfortunately trained other people and women to bulldoze through life and not care Mm -hmm. because that's what worked for me. Mm -hmm. Yep. And it has been amazing. So I am 47. That happened when I was 44. And um, it has been amazing. The last, the last, probably the, the, and to be quite honest, 
there was a situation that happened about a year ago when I was complaining to a friend for an hour and I tripped and fell and I broke my four front teeth in my left shoulder. Mm -hmm. And I will tell you that that moment was so impactful to me about how I had to go four months with broken teeth Mm -hmm. and it, it made me wake up about how vain I am and about how much I care about what I look like Mm -hmm. to people. And so from, you know, from having cancer to having to deal with my mental piece of who, you know, the things that I didn't deal with to how I, how I feel like I always have to be at the top of my game Mm -hmm. from what I look like to my personality, to making sure I'm the one walking in the room and everyone's like, ah, oh, there's Chris. Yes, yeah. yes. And I went four months with broken four front teeth. I went to my mm, daughter's that. wedding um, uh, reception in all the pictures, you know, of these broken crooked teeth. And uh, so anyway, that is my uh, story. And I am honestly really excited that I told it because I've yeah. never, I've never told the story all of yeah. it before. So you're a great storyteller. And the part you didn't tell is that you told mm-hmm. almost nobody. Like we're pretty close friends mm-hmm. and I did not know until after your surgery, I think, that you yeah. had cancer. Yeah, I um I didn't tell people I had cancer. And I'm going to tell you because the fear in people's eyes when you tell me of cancer. Mhm. Mm-hmm. It's too much. Yeah. It's too much. Mm-hmm. You can't. It's a lot. It's of, a lot of extra to deal with. I know other people who are dealing with cancer as well or have and having to coach somebody mm-hmm. else on how to deal with your cancer. That's stressful. It's stressful. Yeah. It's really stressful. And I'll tell you, the people who supported me through my cancer journey, journey strong as fuck, <laughs> strong as fuck, because they never once I never felt like I had to take care of them. Mm-hmm. And you know who you are. You were mm-hmm. there for me. And I love you One with all my heart. Me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't know that. That's how I found out. Yeah. No way. Uh-huh. Yeah. It was a difficult wow. conversation, but, you know. Yeah. Wow. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, um, I... I will tell you that this was healing. I didn't realize, like, I'm going to cry. I didn't realize how this is amazing. You made it all the way through. <laughs> till now. Yeah. Like, I have to tell you for people who, if you've made it through the end of my story and you're here, this is healing. Yeah. Telling your story is really amazing. Mm-hmm. We keep hearing that. And to me, I mean, for... For me, it, you know, it's, I find lessons from stories. That's Mm -hmm. just how I, and it's interesting to get to know somebody at that level and to see, know, see their vulnerability because like we said before, we hide that so much and Mm -hmm. that's how we end up with so much of the strife and the issues that we Mm -hmm. have, you know, Mm -hmm. but you did a good job. Late. Oh, I love you, Mandy. This was (laughs) awesome. Thank you. Love you too. Okay. You're the best. You're the best. All right. Okay. Bye, everybody. Thanks. Bye. Bye.